Perhaps no country in the world is as prepared as Japan when it comes to facing natural disasters. Still, the Sendai quake is testing the country's resilience. Michael Witt, INSEAD Professor of Asian Business and Comparative Management, joins us today to discuss what lies ahead. Apart from the stock market gyrations, what are the worst economic aftershocks that we can expect from the disaster in Japan? Any supply chain disruptions? And where and what and by whom are these likely to be felt? There's always the impression that uh, Japan must be one of the best prepared countries in the world for a disaster like this. And uh, I'm afraid it's very clear now, uh, seeing what we're seeing now, that that is probably not the case. Uh, if you just consider the fact that uh, the, so far the country has been, for instance, incapable of, of getting food to the survivors of the tsunami, or many of the survivors of the tsunami, uh, one really has to wonder what the preparations were. Uh, you hear basically uh, various coverage, for instance, and nothing, uh, people are saying that the food is not being gotten there because there's no fuel available. Well, Japan has half a year's worth of fuel supplies in a strategic reserve. And as far as I know, none of that has been released by the government. So I think what we're seeing here is, is actually uh, indicative of, of not exactly good preparation, but rather the opposite. It's better than in, in 1995 in Kobe, uh, but this is still not an efficient response, at least in my view. Now, uh, in terms of uh, the implications, I actually think the stock market gyrations, if anything, will probably be the least mm. impact that we, we're going to see, at least in the real economy. Uh, obviously, some financial investors are going to lose some money, and some financial investors are going to win some money. Um, but that's that's approximately it. The stock market is not particularly important for the uh, Japanese economy as such, as a source of funding. Um, in terms of outside funding, Japanese companies, uh, on average, only take about one third of their funding needs from the stock markets or from the markets more generally. So that can also be bond, bond issues. Um, the large implications are going to be uh, that this is a very highly interdependent economy uh, in which many parts of, uh, the, uh, of productive activity will actually depend on, on activities that take place elsewhere in Japan. So uh, we hear these days that uh, the affected area only accounts for 7 or 8 percent of GDP in Japan. That is true. But uh, these 7 or 8 percent of GDP, at least part of it, will be inputs that are needed to produce more GDP elsewhere in Japan, and those inputs are missing. Uh, we also hear now that we have all these kind of rolling blackouts in terms of uh, electricity, and this, of course, is affecting not only the, the, uh, the earthquake-stricken region, but also uh, places like Tokyo, which account for a lot more of GDP. Now, this has an impact not only inside the country, but it will have a larger effect on, on Asia in general, because uh, you see actually uh, in many areas where Japan exports in particular, uh, a pan-Asian or sometimes even a global supply chain. Uh, already, Korea, for instance, uh, has basically declared in a state of emergency, or at least uh, companies of Samsung and LG are uh, extremely concerned about missing inputs in the electronics industry from, from Japan. And I think um, as time passes, it will become more and more clear uh, to what extent these, these essential inputs that only the Japanese can provide, um, electronics, but then also certain kind of machine tools uh, that the Japanese make and nobody else in the world makes. Uh, only time will tell uh, what exactly happens once all of a sudden uh, the, the, these exports dry up. So how is this going to affect foreign direct investment into Japan? And what about the confidence of bondholders? In terms of foreign direct investment, what you see is that the amount of investment that goes into Japan is actually relatively small. Bondholders, uh, as many are aware of, uh, something like 96 or 97 percent of outstanding uh, government bonds in Japan, and those, those are the ones you're probably referring mm. to, uh, are held anyway by Japanese investors. Um, so to the extent that perhaps some foreign investors in Japanese bonds get cold feet, uh, that of course can have an e effect uh, at the margin, but in general uh, this is very much a domestic affair. What are the currency implications from all of this? What you're seeing right now, my understanding is, is actually the result of, of speculation that, uh, for instance, Japanese companies may choose to repatriate profits. Um, so um, I think this, this short-term effect is likely to wear away. If you think about the amount of money that the Bank of Japan has injected in the, into the economy, uh, at the same time reasserting, uh, reassuring investors that uh, interest rates will fundamentally remain zero, uh, the long-term effect of this should be, at least in principle, that uh, the yen will fall vis-a-vis -vis other currencies. Are there any comparisons to be drawn from this earthquake and the 1995 earthquake in Kobe? 
luckily some parallels are not to be drawn and that is uh, the disaster response, even though I criticized it earlier, is actually much more effective than it was in 1995. You could now say, well, look at this, uh, they're going to invest a lot in infrastructure, shouldn't that be good, for instance, for economic growth? Perhaps, but we have to think about it. A lot of value has been destroyed and uh, the money that is then being, being put into, into reconstruction of the country, at the same time, it needs to come from somewhere. Now, Japanese have a relatively large store of value. So GDP, as you know, is a flow variable. That's what's added. Uh, what, we're, what we hardly ever measure is what's the stock of wealth that is in a country. Now, Japan is a fairly wealthy country. Mm -hmm. What's likely to happen is you see a transfer from the stock of wealth into the uh, rebuilding of, of the infrastructure that was destroyed. Um, this could have some positive impact on GDP growth in the sense that maybe some of that stock of wealth would otherwise not have been spent. What are the repercussions for national energy security and for energy markets vis-a-vis -vis the nuclear reactor emergencies? And also what kind of impact is this likely to have on diversification away from fossil fuels? Japanese, for historical reasons, uh, this is related to Hiroshima and Nagasaki, are extremely concerned about anything that has to do with, with uh, at least, not necessarily nuclear power, but uh, uh, nuclear contamination. And clearly this has happened in this case. And um, one wonders whether it will be possible for any Japanese government to uh, pursue the same course as they have been pursuing for the last decades, namely uh, make the share of, um, of nuclear power in, in terms of electricity production in Japan increase that share. Um, so there may well be a rethink and um, that is, is, is probably the appropriate response in any case. Globally, you, you already see the, the knock-on effects of this. Some of those responses, I think, are political and emotional in nature, but I think it's fairly clear that uh, th this has not helped the whole idea of emphasizing nuclear power more uh, in order to save the climate. And uh, I think the only logical choice uh, moving forward from here for, for many of these countries, many of the governments, will be to emphasize alternative energies even more. Given what you said about the government's inefficiency in handling the response to the situation, what could be the likely impact on the current administration? Well, the current administration has been described as frozen. Yeah. Um, they don't seem to be particularly effective. and. Um, I think ultimately uh, they will pay a price for this. Uh, it's not entirely fair, I have to say, because uh, here you have the, uh, the opposition party uh, for the first time really being at the helm in Japan. Um, and uh, they are the ones who are likely to get punished for all the problems that are developing now and for, an, for a, in essence, inefficient crisis response. It, they're not entirely to blame because uh, uh, the system within which they operate, that's not the system that they set up. It's a system that evolved uh, while the Liberal Democratic Party was running Japan. And uh, if you will, the inability to deal with things effectively, decisively, and, and just kind of with a rapid response, uh, that inability is built into the structure of government and is thus relatively independent from who exactly is running the place. Um, so the politicians who are running the place right now, obviously, I would expect them to get punished unless some kind of strange psychology sets in and they are being seen as the savers of the Japanese nation. So is there anything positive that can emerge from this disaster that will help Japan revive its economy and come out of its stagnation of the past two decades? This is one of those many myths going around in Japan. One is the myth that is extremely well prepared for disasters. Another is that uh, is the myth that is a high-tech nation. And uh, another myth is that uh, Japan had a really, really rotten time. I mean, it was not fast growing, but if you actually look at the increase in GDP per person in Japan, uh, Japan in the 2000s actually did better than the United States. So, uh, and this is one of the reasons why, why the system has actually uh, probably had such a hard time changing. Now, uh, what does a shock like this one do here? Um, in, in, the best in, the, in the best circumstances, it would actually, shall we say, take the system of the, the, this punctuated equilib equilibrium, the point where it is right now, it would basically knock it off that, and then perhaps it would reconfigure at another and perhaps better equilibrium. The thing is, I, I'm not quite sure this is going to happen here because the blame will get pinned not necessarily on the structure. I think that's where part of the blame for the response, response should go, but I'm not sure that will happen. Um, a lot of blame will go to unforeseen circumstances in terms of this is what nature did to us. Uh, that, is, that is true. Um, and I think uh, part of the, uh, the blame will also go to the individual politicians who were in charge and also, of course, Tokyo Electric Power Corporation.
Um, will people actually go so far as to say we need to fundamentally change the way in which Japan is run? And uh, here, um, I wish that were the case, but I'm not optimistic about that. My outlook would be that Japan will obviously recover from this. Um, it will, however, I don't really see that this particular event right now will lead to a Japan that, uh, in, in the way it functions, is fundamentally different five or ten years from now. I pray that I'm wrong because I think some changes are necessary and you know I'm not talking about becoming like the United States but uh, I'm talking about shall we say improvements that are possible within within the parameters that Japanese considerable consider desirable um, but I'm just not sure that that the impetus from from this event uh, will be strong enough to produce that thank you for joining us Michael